Hi, everyone. My name is Jared Persinger. I'm a database specialist solutions architect with Amazon Web Services, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Dustin Brown, also a database specialist solutions architect with Amazon Web Services. And today we're going to talk to you about a digital payments architecture that we created. Our digital payments architecture falls under a program known as DB Galvanized. DB stands for database, and DB Galvanized was created to help customers migrate their financial services industry workloads over to open source databases like Amazon Aurora and Amazon RDS. Historically, there's been a misconception that commercial databases were safer, more secure than open source databases. And that's really what this program is designed to do is help kind of demystify some of those misconceptions. And we have a couple of ways that we can help here. So we have, uh, we can provide use cases and studies, best practices, we can also uh, put you in touch with a database specific uh, account team with people like Dustin and I, and we can provide proof of concept credits. That's something that's particularly interesting or interesting to customers. So why digital payments on AWS? First and foremost, security, right? We're talking about the financial services industry. So security always needs to be top of mind and security is always top of mind with us at AWS. So our AWS architecture supports some of the most stringent security standards in the financial services industry. Then we move on to compliance. Compliance is something that of course is a cornerstone of financial services as well. And we support the highest standards of financial regulatory compliance with our AWS services. Next, differentiation. And I think this is really cool. It gives you an opportunity to stand out among different financial services industry uh, competitors by building modern architectures on open source databases like Aurora and RDS. And you know, that's a great point, Jared, uh, the ability to differentiate with AWS services, specifically uh, AWS database managed uh, services is, is a great way to build modern architectures uh, that lend well to microservices model, decoupling your different aspects of, of, of your tables out into the appropriate uh, database managed instance, such as Aurora, uh, Postgres, Aurora, MySQL, and into the NoSQL space, such as a uh, DynamoDB, given the opportunity to auto scale, uh, to uh, scale to, to the meet the, the needs of your uh, of all of our customers. So differentiations are a, a really important part. It's a great point, Dustin, and and that really kind of leads us into modernization, right? I mean, um, if you can differentiate, then you're probably modernizing as well. Um, we give you the option to free up people like database administrators to really work with your app developer teams to kind of modernize and create new and innovative applications that speak to your customers. So we had some goals when we set out to create this digital payments architecture, um, and, and, and they're kind of here highlighted, uh, with security, speed, scalability, availability, and reliability. So first and foremost, again, security, you're gonna continue to hear this throughout our presentation today. Um, but we wanted to focus on uh, a lot of the tools that are available in AWS to be able to safeguard uh, payments and financial services industry um, data. And then speed. You need to be able to do things quickly, right? The faster you can take transactions, the faster the faster you can make money. So uh, that's an important thing with, uh, with all of the databases that we're going to be talking about today and the architecture as a whole. And then massive scalability. We need to be able to grow uh, with our customers. Uh, if we get more customers, we want to be able to grow with them. Uh, some of the ways that we can do that is storage auto scaling, uh, read replica auto scaling, or even some of the new uh, serverless instance offerings that we have available. Finally, we want to achieve availability and reliability. Those are, of course, always going to be important. If your customers can't access your application and your database, then they are not able to do the payments that we're trying to achieve on this platform. Yeah, that's, that's a great point, a great, great uh, point about uh, availability and reliability. And it typically as a as a database administrator myself for, for, for many years, uh, being able to have your, your systems be highly available, highly reliable. Um, and that's one thing that Amazon Aurora uh, can definitely provide, uh, spanning multiple availability zones, spanning multiple regions, even having your automated, uh, automated backups taken care of for you. Um, being able to achieve that high availability in your financial systems is something that's, uh, that's, that's pretty paramount. Absolutely. So let's go on to the next slide here. We're going to talk about, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the architecture before we show you the diagram. 
Um, so some of the key components here, one of them is going to be this payment processor API. What that's going to allow us to do is really offload a lot of the risk of storing sensitive credit card data in our application. Uh, we, we, we put that responsibility on the payment processor and we connect to an API. That payment processor then returns a token that represents that credit card information. So again, keeping uh, security of this credit card data is very important. And that's one way that we do that by offloading that to the payment processor. Uh, another piece that's important is data isolation. We're trying to move away from these monolithic architectures and we're trying to get into a, uh, a more decoupled architecture. And you'll see that with uh, the use of virtual private clouds. Uh, we'll see that in the diagram here shortly, uh, but we separate the data layer and the application layer. And then, Really, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to store business data, really. Uh, we want to be able to store these transactions so that we can go back and see what we did, what customers purchased what. If there's a, a something like a return or something like that, we need to have that data available somewhere so we know that that transaction actually occurred and we can verify that. So what we're going to use for that is Amazon Aurora. Uh, and Aurora is our fast commercial grade database uh, built natively in the cloud and it's very secure and very scalable as you'll see when we go into the uh, deeper portions there and then lastly we want to uh, cache the session information in all in uh, amazon elastic cache elastic cache is going to allow us to move at very high speed it's going to provide very low latency and it's going to be able to uh and, and it's, it's going to be a great feature to help us with these financial transactions so let's go into the architecture slide next you can see we have this diagram here. Uh, we'll start at the top. We have, as you can see, we have our users here at the top um, represented. That's that's really the users, the the company that is uh, that is that is selling or the the purchaser. Uh, they are all kind of encompassed in that icon there. And then over here to the right, you have the uh, pay, payment processor API as well. Um, what we're going to do is have the users uh, log on through uh, Amazon Route 53. That's our domain name service. Um, and they are going to be able to authenticate in uh, something called Amazon Cognito. Cognito is a, a way that we enable third party authentication to your application. You don't have to use this. This is just an example of what we use for the sample architecture. Of course, you could use username and password, something like that. Um, that's really up to the user to decide how they want to do that. Um, then moving over to the left of that, we want to highlight a couple of security features since we're since we're honing in on security so much with this architecture. We want to point out uh, AWS Shield. So AWS Shield is our distributed denial of service um, security measure that we take. And then we also have the web application firewall. So the web application firewall is going to do all of the things that that, applica that firewalls do, uh, preventing unauthorized access on certain ports and things like that. But again, just a couple of extra security features that we have, have added here to this architecture. And then as you can see, the line kind of goes down from there and it goes to into something called the customer VPC. So the customer VPC is our virtual private cloud. It's a logically isolated portion of the AWS cloud. Uh, the customer can have several of these uh, on, on one account, but that it's a way to isolate your data and create some privacy uh, between other portions of your workload. So we're in this customer VPC, and then within this customer VPC, you'll also see these, uh, these blue boxes here called availability zones. Availability zones allow us to have greater availability. When you talk about availability zones, we're uh, talking about a uh, one or many data centers that are separated by different floodplains and electrical grids. So you can imagine that gives us a, a degree of, uh, of security and reliability there as well. So we move down into, the, into this uh, VPC and we hit our application load balancer. Our application load balancer just balances the load so that we're not hitting one or more instances too many times and causing a, a poor experience for our customers. So that application load balancers hits the public subnet then. The public subnet uh, is, we at some point we have to have a customer facing portion of this, right? At some point, support point it has to reach the public in order to reach our customers. But we don't necessarily want all of our other layers like our application and our data, data layer exposed to the general public. So you can see within this public subnet, we have a couple of EC2 instances here. They're in an auto scaling group, which I'll get to in a bit. 
Um, but those EC2 instances are really just routing the requests down to the private subnets. And then you can also see the NAT gateways there as well. Those are going to serve outbound requests, which you'll see in a moment. So as we move down into this private subnet, you can see we have a few more EC2s or a couple more EC2s. And this could be many EC2 instances. Uh, they're in an auto scaling group. And what that auto scaling group is going to allow us to do is kind of expand and contract the number of EC2 instances that are available for this application, depending upon the amount of uh, need at the time. So think something like Black Friday, you're probably going to need a significantly larger amount of, uh, of EC2 instances than you would on a regular day. Those EC2 instances are going to take that request and forward that up to the payment processor. So you can see there in step five, we have the payment processor up outside of the, uh, the AWS cloud. And the way that we're able to forward that outbound request is through that NAT gateway that you see there in the public subnet. But what that payment processor is going to do is it's going to confirm the credit card information that's available and supply our application with a token that represents that credit card information. So again, we're never storing open credit card information on our application or in our database anywhere. We're offloading that responsibility to the payment processor API. And there are a multitude of different payment processors up there out there. We just want to leave that option open to the uh, to the greater to, to the user. So once the payment processor confirms that, it goes back down to the application layer, and then the application, the uh, the front end application, forwards that out of the data, out of the VPC through the VPC endpoint. That moves into something called Amazon Private Link, which connects these two uh, these two VPCs, and that allows us to connect into that other VPC. So you can have one account with multiple VPCs, as you can see here. So again, this is a, another logically isolated portion of the AWS cloud that allows us to create greater security for our data layer. So within the data layer, we have um, the Amazon API gateway. Within the Am Amazon API gateway, we've created a REST API that we connect to. The API then connects over to several, one, two or more availability zones to increase uh, availability. And then you can see within that first private subnet, we have uh, Lambda doing our application logic. We chose Lambda for this one. You could really choose anything you want. You could choose an EC2 instance to run this application. Really, any, any, it's up to the individual user to decide that. But we thought Lambda was cool because it's a serverless offering and allows us to run uh, our code in seconds and only pay for the, the amount of time that we're using it. So what that's doing is it's taking, it could be doing extraction, transformation, and loading, and forwarding all of this into our database, really storing it in the database in the structure that we want. And as you can see in the bottom layer there, really the base of this entire application is Amazon Aurora. Uh, that is our single source of truth here. And then within that also, we have Amazon Elasticache. So Elasticache is going to be providing that sub millisecond latency. It's going to be doing some uh, some session caching and allow us to have very high speed transactions. It is not a required element of this, but it's certainly nice to have, especially if you plan on doing a lot of different transactions. And now the last couple of things I'm going to draw your attention to here are in the bottom right corner. So we have our uh, security and compliance features here. These are just a couple of more tools that we wanted to call out for you. So we have our um, secrets manager and AWS secrets manager allows you to store things like your database credentials in secrets manager and even rotate those credentials on a scheduled basis to comply with whatever your, uh, your needs are. Then we also have AWS identity and access management. What identity and access management is going to allow you to do is control all of the things in your, your database and, or in, in your AWS environment. So it's going to allow your engineers and your administrators to log on and tinker around with all of the portions of your architecture uh, in a secure fashion. And then lastly, we have uh, Amazon Key Management Service, AWS Key Management Service. So the AWS Key Management Service is going to store all of the uh, cryptographic keys for your data at rest. So whether those are crypt, uh, customer managed keys or AWS managed keys, you could save them all securely in AWS Key Management Service. Now, finally, we'll uh, move over to the right here and we'll talk about uh, some of the monitoring options we have here. So we have um, Amazon CloudTrail, 
Uh, that is going to allow us to take a look at anything that's happening administratively in our database. So if we have our, admit, uh, our users going in there and maybe perhaps someone's accidentally deleted a table or dropped a table, we can use something like CloudTrail to be able to go back in there, take a look at that and, and find out uh, who, who did it, when it happened. Uh, it gives us great, great uh, options to look back and monitor compliance. And then lastly, for uh, monitoring, we have Amazon CloudWatch. CloudWatch is great because it's going to provide metrics about our databases, our instances, all sorts of different uh, OS level metrics and display those in graphs uh, for, for you to use later on. Yeah, thanks, Jared, for that for that great overview and that diagram of uh, of of architecting and migrating over your financial systems to uh, to Amazon Aurora, what that might look like. And as you can tell, we've we've uh, kind of did an expansive expansive view, integrating other security components such as Cognito, the application layer, um, and uh, uh, an entire ecosystem uh, available, uh, not just at the database, but now focusing a little bit more on the database, um, Amazon Aurora for MySQL or PostgreSQL. Um, as, as you may know, is a fully managed uh, and commercial grade database service. Uh, it's, it's ideal for the financial services industry. It's highly available, durable, uh, highly compliant, and, um, caught and, and uh, it, it can be cost optimized uh, use, using the open source engines that you are, are familiar with, such as MySQL and, and Postgres. Uh, the, other, the other side of this coin is Amazon Elasticash, which offers a fully managed caching service designed to meet the needs uh, for your ultra low latency, which oftentimes is sub millisecond, uh, for your, in, your in your transactional financial service applications. These two database platforms coupled together can create a low latency, highly available relational environment that will uh, securely store your, uh, your, your credit card transactions and your financial transactions um, that you would be migrating over. So moving on to security in the database layer, uh, it's important to understand the different security tools and resources that are available to our AWS customers, specifically in the Aurora, uh, Postgres, and MySQL arenas. Security is, is more important than ever. Uh, being able to securely store your transaction information, customer data uh, is vital, especially in this day and age. Uh, to protect data in transit, uh, we're going to start. We're going to start with data in transit, as it, AWS encourages our customers to leverage a multi-level approach. All network between AWS data centers is transparently encrypted at the physical layer. All traffic within a VPC and between peered VPCs across regions is transparently encrypted at the network layer when using when using uh, supported instance types. The following connections can be combined with AWS Private Link to provide connectivity between your private network and your AWS environment. So you could use AWS site-to-site -site VPN connection or uh, AWS direct connect connection. The second aspect of, of security would be database isolation. And with Aurora, and oftentimes uh, many customers ask me this question, are, is my database truly isolated? Uh, can, can other customers access my data? Can AWS access my data? And the answer is that your database is, is, is isolated. Each database server has a VM enforced isolation boundary, and it does not share the underlying kernel, the CPU resources, the memory resources, or the elastic network interface with any other server, which offers a true isolation of your data from, 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 from outside influences. At the application layer, you can also have a choice about whether and how to use additional encryption using a protocol like transport layer security or TLS, which many of you are, are no doubt familiar with. You also need to be able to access your resources securely and efficiently. One recommended approach would be to use AWS identity and access management tools for database administration. We also got you covered uh, for storing and rotating your database credentials with AWS Secrets Manager. Uh, using AWS Secrets Manager allows you to easily rotate, manage, and retrieve database credentials, API keys, and any other secrets uh, through their, through their uh, user-defined lifecycle. Uh, so any passwords, any database passwords, any other secret information that need to be stored, encrypted, and uh, passed to the, to the database layer at the appropriate time uh, can be stored in AWS Secrets. Many customers use this as a trusted tool to uh, securely store their, their, uh, their secrets. Uh, next, we want to mention compliance validation. You want to ensure that your database meets your compliance requirements. 
You will have the option to audit your environment with third-party auditors to assess the security and the compliance of, of, of your AWS services as, as part of a multiple AWS compliance programs, uh, with an example of being SOC, PCI, FedRAMP, and, and HIPAA. Next, we'll, we'll mention logging and monitoring to AWS CloudTrail and AWS CloudWatch. You can think of CloudWatch as a central repository for all of your AWS log, logging needs. Uh, Aurora integrates very well with the rest of the AWS ecosystem and, and has been designed specifically to do so. You can send all of your logging to CloudWatch and also using CloudTrail. Uh, in conjunction with these two services, you'll have a full audit uh, uh, of, all, of all of your logs that can be used later on for reporting purposes, for audit purposes, uh, et cetera. And lastly on our list is the ability to audit your database using another purpose-built tool uh, known as database activity streams uh, or other, you all, and you also have the opportunity uh, to implement other native auditing tools as well. Uh, for, for a list of supported tools, you can uh, talk to your account team and, and see what might work with, uh, with what's already working within your organization, or you can uh, adopt uh, database activity streams. So using uh, Amazon Aurora in financial systems, um, storing transaction information from the application is a very sensitive area. Um, storing a token as a representation of the credit card number instead of the credit card number increases the security for each transaction. This token may be used as a reference for each purchase or even for refunds that would need to be processed days or even weeks later. You'll, able to, you, you'll be able to use this token as a reference point for any previous transaction that has occurred uh, for any auditing purposes, and uh, it is considered to be secure as it is not the actual credit card number. Uh, that is actually handled at the payment processor layer, which is outside of, of Aurora. Moving on to a different aspect of being highly scalable for both read and write functionality, it's really important to understand that Aurora will scale for, for your needs. You have push button or even automated scaling with Amazon Aurora serverless will allow you to plan, for, uh, plan big for your future database uh, uh, performance needs uh, in the future will allow you to plan. And even for those moments where you can't plan, it is a uh, push of a button. You can have a larger instance size than you can stay, you can scale up, up to uh, many magnitudes higher. And then the last, uh, what we mentioned here earlier was encryption at rest and in transit. Um, you'll, you'll be able to use those uh, networking uh, tools and uh, encryption uh, to, to keep your environment uh, very secure. As the sister component of this, of this architecture, we wanted to also, again, mention uh, Amazon Elasticast for Redis. Uh, using Amazon Elasticast as a distributed cache for session management as a very popular uh, and, and friendly way of, uh, of increasing uh, low latency transactions and connections and, incre and increase user, uh, your, your user uh, experience. Uh, Non-persistent storage needed to track whether transactions are authorized uh, and authenticated is also a good use case for Amazon Elasticash. It also allows you to capture sessions to allow retries for transactions if failure occurs. So it's a, a, a very good counterpart to Amazon Aurora inside of this architecture for these reasons. So sometimes it's really helpful to, to see a, a model of, of your schema of what this might look like going forward. Um, so this is a sample database model that we put together to show how the payment processing database might look like. You'll notice the three distinct tables, the payments authorization, the transaction info, and the payments tables. Turning your attention to the payments table, you'll notice the card token column. Notice we are not storing the actual credit card numbers, but simply the token of, of the uh, of of the card itself. So no sensitive information from a credit card perspective is stored in, in the actual database. And you can see the payments authorization tables allows for the approval codes for the transaction ID, and then the transaction info allows you to have the product code, uh, where the terminal, where the, where the transaction came from, which terminal, and the, the payment method that they're actually using. So this is an example of, the, of a database model that you might uh, adopt on on one of your financial systems in, in, in Amazon Aurora. Yeah, I really like this slide because it's, although it is simple, it kind of gives users a place to start from, you know, uh, their, their tables and their schemas will likely be much larger and more complex than this, but it kind of gets the wheels spinning if you haven't used a uh, payment processing service before. Great point. 
Next, let's move our attention a little bit more to the performance in the database layer. We talked about security. We talked about um, high availability. Let's talk about performance. So as many of you are already familiar with Amazon Aurora, you understand that it, uh, Amazon Aurora can scale up to 15 separate read replicas. And these read replicas can be scaled across multiple availability zones for, for high availability purposes. Being able to have uh, these read replicas allows you to port over your read traffic uh, and to, to scale up to 15 different instances up to a, uh, a large instance such as a 16x large instance. Um, not all of the replicas need to be the same size as the primary. You may have very low write traffic, you may have very high read traffic, vice versa. Depending on what your needs are, you can, you can scale uh, to the appropriate level. Uh, you also have the opportunity to uh, implement your read replicas in an auto-scaling fashion, uh, which would allow the read replicas to be created as traffic increases, and then, and then those read replicas be taken away as traffic decreases. Um, in addition to this, you can also scale to, to uh, globally with uh, Amazon Aurora Global Database. This allows you to have cross-region replication uh, to any part uh, where any uh, database AWS region exists in the world. Uh, this allows for uh, a better customer experience uh, being able to host your databases wherever they actually live. You can track your performance metrics through performance insights and enhanced monitoring. Being able to en enable performance insights, insights and enhanced monitoring inside of your database is a great way for database administrators and for those who are looking to understand their database performance. Uh, you're able to drill down to the actual query level of what is occurring on the database tie it to particular SQL weight types, uh, such as uh, network issues, CPU issues, memory issues, uh, and other certain weight types. And you can understand exactly what's going on with your database. Uh, being able to take back to your developers uh, and or your fe fellow database administrators and saying, hey, we need to optimize this query. This is taking 80% of our resources. In addition to that, you have something called enhanced monitoring, which allows you to monitor uh, metrics at the OS level. This gives you a, a, a more of a particular insight into the operating system. Um, even though we have these safeguards built around Aurora and you can't actually access the operating system, we've enabled enhanced monitoring so that you can see and monitor exactly what's going on at a process level. I really love performance insights. Uh, it's something I encourage all of my customers to use, and I've gotten great feedback from them on performance insights. Just the ability to look at like a simple dashboard and see the, the what's going on with your SQL queries and what the impact is on your actual instance is just is great. Being able to to see it kind of in a uh, uh, a way that that allows for a graphic experience. It, it shows you exactly where your weights are and what query they're tied to. And it makes it uh, extremely efficient, get in there, understand your query, try to optimize it and move on from that issue. Uh, we also have the opportunity to scale vert vertically to handle new transactions and increased app usage. You can scale up to the 16X large instances in Amazon Aurora, which is a, a fairly large instance. Uh, for more information on that, uh, please see those instance sizes. Um, being able to scale up to that size, both on the on the primary and also on the read replicas, uh, makes for a, a massive scaling experience. Probably a good time to talk about serverless instances as well. Uh, they give you the ability to scale instantly uh, up to 128 Aurora capacity units, which basically equates to 256 gigabytes of RAM, and that's a new feature that's been uh, really great. A lot has a lot of customers interested. That's a great point. And with Aurora Serverless V2, you have a lot of the same features that you have with Aurora, such as uh, cloning, the automated backups, the uh, replication across different availability zones, as well as uh, up to the 15 read replicas with Aurora Serverless. So great new addition. And then Amazon Elastic Cache is the last thing we'll mention here. It allows you to choose the numbers of shards and replica based on your caching needs. So depending on the mode that you choose, you can, you can replicate and, and scale um, as well. And anytime we're talking about migrating to Aurora, it's really important to understand uh, the need to appropriately right size the environment. Um, so you want to create a, a good POC that will address your success criteria for the viability of moving to the platform. We really want you to understand uh, what how your how your database is going to uh, to perform on the Aurora platform. Uh, you want to identify the number of transactions per second for both read and writes. You want to be able to test your workload based on expected users and the, the amount of transactions. You want to look into oversizing the database initially 
um, to set up and then reduce the database once traffic is stable. So oftentimes we'll see a customer, they'll uh, double the instant size of what they feel that they need. And then they, they right size, they monitor, they see exactly the type of traffic that's going on there. And then that's the great thing about uh, Amazon Aurora and the cloud in general is that you can scale back down to only what you need. This will help you identify the, the appropriate instant size for your workload. And then also uh, heavily monitor uh, for CPU and memory utilization, both from a cost savings and a performance perspective is, is, uh, is really important when you're migrating to the cloud. One aspect of right sizing that we traditionally talk about is, is right sizing your storage, right? I mean, in Aurora, you no longer really have to worry about that. You have up to 128 terabytes of storage, and that's going to grow and shrink as your data grows and shrinks. That's a great point. The storage does automatically does automatically scale whether or not you are on Aurora Serverless or Aurora Standard. Continuing our discussion for right sizing the database environment, we want to talk about a little bit more about uh, monitoring your, your database workload. Being able to monitor the the queries that are coming through, uh, where whether or not they're hitting the cache, whether or not they're going to the database uh, disk layer, is very important to understand in Amazon Aurora. Uh, with Aurora, you're charged for I.O. operations that occur when it goes down to the disk layer. So monitoring that workload to determine if you have if your cache is, is sized uh, appropriately will help you uh, get the most uh, cost savings and most cost efficiency possible. Um, when you're when you're moving over to Aurora from your on premise environment, a question I often get asked is, why should I trust? AWS and Amazon Aurora with my databases, especially in the financial services uh, department. It's a great question. I get asked this often as I meet with, uh, with, with, with many different customers. And it usually turns into a great discussion that we can talk about going back to that POC. Let's build out that POC. I don't want you just to adopt this. We don't want you to uh, have blind faith that this all works. We want you to test the process. Uh, as an example, you can test your database failovers. Does multi-AZ failover actually work? Does it give me the response times that uh, the AWS documentation says it does? Are my databases being able to be uh, backed up and restored in the way that the documentation says? As part of that POC, uh, we encourage you, we highly encourage you to, to test off, uh, to, to, to check off those boxes. Yes, the automation is working as promised. Um, Start with a small database workload, or smart with maybe a start with a, a, a less risky application. Build that muscle, build that migration muscle, build the faith, build the confidence that, uh, that AWS can be a truly trusted partner. Um, and as you right size for for cost, for performance, and for security, uh, that will allow you to build that trust and be able to successfully migrate your workloads. Going back to the cache workload discussion, it's very important to um, allocate enough RAM to your instance, as we talked about before. And these two uh, metrics down here, volume read IOPS and buffer cache hit ratio, will help you understand how uh, much of your queries are going to the query, uh, are going to the cache versus the disk subsystem. You want to keep your transactions short in Aurora. You're going to get the most bang for your buck doing that. And then you want to paralyze your workload and your queries. The disk, the database uh, subsystem, uh, is 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 going to uh, uh, highly be highly efficient when you paralyze your actually your your actual workload and your queries. On the topic of proofs of concept, uh, it's important to know that you're you're never alone throughout this process. Uh, you know we have great account teams with a, a lot of different technical experts on all these to include database specialist solutions architects like Dustin and I. Uh, Dustin's given a lot of great corners to help people look around, uh, but you're never going to be alone throughout this process. So that's uh, something important to keep in mind. And let's go through a, a few, just a couple of customer examples. It, it may be helpful to see how other organizations have actually uh, have actually migrated their financial systems to Amazon Aurora. Uh, Afterpay is is a good is a great example. Afterpay is a payments platform that helps customers, particularly. Uh, Generation Z and Millennials make payments in accordance with their lifestyle, allowing them to purchase a product immediately and pay for it later. Um, Afterpay chose AWS to create a centralized data platform that would allow Afterpay to bring together disparate internal sources of data, store the data, and enable the querying of that data. 
With AWS, Afterpay can now query data in 45 seconds, down from 45 minutes on premises and execute uh, its ETL processes. Uh, and these processes are down to about 15 minutes, reduced, reduced from about 12 hours of, of, of VTL processing time before. Another great example is, uh, is PPRO. PPRO moved the implementation of alternative payment connectors to AWS using cutting edge technologies to attract developers and accelerate their onboarding. After that experience, all applications are in the, migra are, are in the migration process to AWS and they're continuing to migrate their, their infrastructure. With AWS, PPRO is able to scale seamlessly and increase developer productivity. This FinTech also benefits from high availability in the cloud using Amazon Aurora and also Amazon uh, DynamoDB. PPRO's multi-sided network of global payments companies use PPRO's APIs for a variety of functions, including a localized gateway, uh, processing, and merchant acquire services. I really like this example because it calls out the fact that they used Amazon Aurora and Amazon DynamoDB. Uh, customers don't really ever have to choose to just go move their database from one database to another AWS service. Oftentimes, a, a combination of different services is the right answer. Using the right purpose-built database for the right workload is what we're all about. So how can AWS help? Right, we've talked we've talked about the the DB Galvanize program. We've talked about uh, trusting us with your with, with your financial systems on running on our infrastructure and our, our purpose built uh, managed database services. Uh, how can we help as a solutions architect? Uh, architects Jared and I are are our, uh, our goal is to is to and our, our primary function is to help customers succeed in their in their POCs and their use cases in understanding uh, the, the best path forward to, to migrating their, their database infrastructure. We can give you uh, uh, financial systems use cases and, and case studies that, that way you can see uh, and read up on how other financial industry, industries have migrated to, the, to Amazon Aurora. Uh, we can give you uh, the most modern data strategy best practices. Uh, we have the state of the art information uh, at our fingertips and uh, access to uh, a lot of great people that can, uh, that can help uh, give lots of prescriptive guidance for best practices. Uh, we, we have access to webinars, executive roundtable discussions, and, and data modernization week sessions that can, uh, that can allow you to adopt and, and, uh, and migrate even faster. Um, with these database migration workshops, you also have access to uh, particular partners that can help accelerate and actually help you do the work, uh, which we have access to to, to, to make those introductions. Uh, we can give you some proof of concept credits, which are very nice uh, in, when you're doing your testing. So that uh, during that time of where you're trying to build that trust and build those uh, migration muscles and uh, the knowledge base that you need, uh, you, you, you can do that on our dime. And then uh, database specific account teams, uh, you have access to uh, specifically your account team, uh, they have access to a database solutions architect, please reach out to them. We can get you uh, some help for, for, uh, for successfully mi migrating your, your, financial, your financial systems. Well, Dustin, I think that covers it. We say we go into some question and answer session. Yeah, I, I, I think we're ready for that. We have uh, Justin and Sudar here to help us answer these questions as well. So looking forward to that.